Bonsoir. Bonsoir tout le monde. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes? Excellent. Bienvenue. We're very happy to receive you today at our theater, Obam Sawin, and director of the Balmoral Island at the film office board. Have a happy ocean day. For us, it's practically Christmas, and we're very happy for you to be here to celebrate with us. And before we start with this discussion, I'd like to ask our new commissioner, Suzanne Guimon, to share a few words of welcome. Hello, everyone. Well, having looking at us on, on online, I think we're streaming live here. So uh, hello, everybody. Donc, uh, ben, bienvenue, uh, comme on disait. So welcome, as we were saying at the NFB, we're very happy to have you here, obviously with our environmental and uh, ocean uh, preoccupations, and they are part of our landscape today. It's something that we cannot avoid or pretend that it doesn't exist. So we're very happy to listen to this panel today who is going to talk about the ocean and the impact that we can have with uh, children and youth and different uh, auditories and the NFB can play an interesting role in communication having to do with these issues. And so, obviously, this is what we're doing with uh, Jacques' uh, governance with the uh, school, uh, the Ocean School, with, uh, and what he's developing with his partners, um, ministries and uh, fisheries and aquaculture. Have a happy panel. Thank you for being within us and have a lovely evening. Thank you, Susan. Of indigenous and other peoples, uh, I would like to invite you to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we all call home. Uh, we do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their unique worldviews. Uh, the NFB also acknowledges that uh, since the early 1940s, we've been producing works about indigenous lives and experiences. And while many of these films have helped build understanding between indigenous and non-indigenous Canadians, others have helped shape and perpetuate racist and colonial perceptions of indigenous people. Uh, at Ocean School, we are on a learning journey, and we hope that tonight's conversation will be just one more step on that path. So what's going to happen tonight? Well, we split this conversation into four parts. Uh, each is going to be punctuated by a little piece of content from Ocean School, because, you know, we couldn't come to this beautiful theater and not show you some video. We, we make video, generally, at Ocean School that gets seen on a small Chromebook in a classroom, yet we have big ambitions and to have a screen this big and to be able to play some content for you is really exciting for us. Uh, and we're going to start uh, by hearing from what we expect to be the next generation of ocean literate citizens with a piece that we created a few years ago that brings together some young voices from around the world. Let's have a look. It's just really beautiful and it's full of amazing creatures and organisms that we don't see anywhere else on our planet. The life of the human is defended by the ocean. It's one of the principal sources of hydration in the world. If the ocean is polluted, then it will affect our food supply. It's also a city where many animals live and it's very important for us. If you don't learn about the ocean, then how will you know about all the amazing things on it? Mm -hmm. 
Marine creatures that are really interesting are jellyfish. They are the ultimate survivors. One of them, Thoritopsis nutricula, can revert back to its younger state of life and therefore is practically immortal. My animal marine favorite is the dolphin. The beluga whale because they're really soft and really cute. My favorite sea creature is the sea urchin. It lives up to over 200 years old. Ang favorite ko pong lamang dagat ay pawigan. Because it's like slow and it takes its time, but in the water it can go really fast. المحيط يفتح لنا مجال ما كثير من الأشغال مثل الصيد أنا أكبر شغل في البحر. الأوسيان هي très important pour la régulation du climat. ويؤثر فيها ويشجع السياحة وبشكل دخل للأسر والدولة ويسهم في التوازن البيئي وبتكثير التوار البحرية كالسمك والمرجان. قاضي بكيل لبعض حوالين بد بد بدوين تو وحين نصف في ديسا أبرنا كنتا هو ده هو ده سو الله قدر دلنا كريا كورنتا كورنتا ده سو الله يراده كورنتا ده هو ده. لأنه ليس لان إتو بس تأيسان ملاقين أن يوم توبيج. نونيت إتو أن دوجم بوهاي نع أتى بلانتا. There's a lot we need to discover about the ocean and when we do, we can innovate new ideas to put more use to the ocean while protecting it. If the world treated us like we treated the ocean, then there wouldn't be any us. Memahami ekosistem lautan sangat penting bagi kita untuk menjaga bumi kita. Why study marine science? Why not? It's fascinating! Sergio! <laughs> so, all right. He disappeared. They both disappeared. Oh, it's okay. They're going to wait till I name them, I think. So, to talk about ocean literacy, we, we've gathered uh, a variety of voices that are connected in different ways to the ocean. Uh, she is the national lead of the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition. And I think many people in the country would agree that she's the heart and soul of ocean literacy in Canada. So I'd like to welcome Diz Lithrow. Do you, do you like us to say the doctor? Because there is a doctor. No? Okay. Definitely not. Diz, come and join. <laughs> Joining us online from California, uh, a passionate researcher and ocean advocate that Ocean School had the pleasure of working with on an expedition to beautiful Cocos Island in Costa Rica. Please ver welcome virtually Sergio Madrigal, who we saw for a second there. There he is, Sergio! Bonjour, hi everyone. Hi! Our next panelist has a parcours atypical. Our next panelist has an interdisciplinary work and she has worked a lot with conservation and conservation of the oceans and she's put her expertise to the service of social economy. Let's welcome Anne-Marie Asselin, founder and organizer of Bleu and Marine Biologist. She's an Inuk youth leader from Nain in Nunatsiavut. She's an experienced researcher and a climate advocate who also works on language revitalization. Please welcome Megan Dicker Shasak. I think. <laughs> Hi, Megan. Hi. And last but certainly not least, a master environmental storyteller who's created content for the Discovery Channel, for the Spitstonian, and who's one of the people who's really been at the heart of helping define how we tell stories at Ocean School, Scott Simpson. All right, so it's round one, guys, round one. There's going to be four rounds. There's no math. 
involved. There will be no math questions. Uh, but I want to get to know you guys a little bit. So I'm going to start with Megan. Megan, growing up in Nain, like, what was the role of the ocean in your life? Well, most of what we eat comes from the ocean. Um, and we spend a lot of time also traveling, hunting and fishing on the ocean in the summer, but also on the sea ice in the winter months. Since I live on, well, my home is on the coast, my life pretty much revolves around the ocean and what we do, how we um, interact with it, but also it affects the weather a lot. So no matter what, um, I'm impacted by the ocean in like the best ways. That's, that's awesome. Scott, now how does your connection to the ocean express itself? Like as someone growing up in the US and then moving to Nova Scotia next to the water, how did that change your connection to the ocean? Um, well, I, yeah, I, uh, growing up in, in suburban New York, I did spend my summers in Nova Scotia, where my family kind of um, roots are, and in particular, in, um, spent a lot of time in Cape Breton Island. So for anybody who knows Cape Breton, uh, the west coast of Cape Breton is maybe the best kept secret um, in our nation as far <laughs> as beaches go. So we spent a lot of time on the beach, West Mabu Beach. The warmest waters north of the Carolina, they say. And so, you know, that was what my, my childhood was spent, really, a lot of it. A lot of my childhood summers were spent on the, on the beach there. But I also had um, relatives, and my mother is from Newfoundland. And I think, you know, in a lot of ways, traveling to Newfoundland to visit family was the first time that I really kind of, uh, I, I got a concept of what it's like to be on the ocean like being on the ferry from North Sydney, Cape Breton to Port of Basque. Newfoundland to me was a big, vast ocean journey, even though it's very small when you look at that map. So that was kind of my, my early kind of the awe was being a kid um, on that ferry, eating open-faced turkey sandwiches and eating French fries. <laughs> um, but looking out on the, and seeing like the, the, the idea of like a 360 degree horizon that's nothing but ocean. Anne-Marie, toi, la passion de l'océan, ça, ça date de long. And Anne-Marie, your passion for of the ocean has uh, dated for many years. Was there a crucial experience that has formed your relationship with the ocean? Well, for a story that is similar to that of Scott's, uh, when I was a kid, uh, we would spend our summers in Trois Pistoles. I come from Quebec. I grew up in the city. And to connect myself during the summer season to the St. Lawrence River, you know, the water was 60 degrees, it was super cold, but it didn't stop me from spending many hours in the water. And it wasn't rare that I had friends with, uh, um, with the seals and they'd come very close to me and even in the lower uh, tides, it was a whole new universe that was opening up to me. Uh, before the age of five, I wanted to be an astrol uh, astrologist, and afterwards, I wanted to become a marine biologist. And towards the age of the age of eighteen, I had a uh, scuba diving accident. But it was time for me to better understand the environment in which I was working. And so I had lots of technical knowledge, but very f little uh, knowledge of the ecosystem. And that's how I became a marine biologist. And so I've had lots of sailing expeditions and and the content that I learned really opened up on a new universe and all the stories that we can tell about the discovery of oceans and natural environments, but also how to conserve it. Excellent. To do the work you're doing, do you think if we had like 12 year old Diz, do you think she would have predicted this path? Oh, that's a great question, and uh, I, I'm laughing as I, my parents would say it, it took a long time for Diz to probably find her path. And, and for me, it was freshwater. Like, I was a kid who grew up on the rivers and lakes and Georgian Bay and, and spent all through my teenage years and well into my 20s and maybe creeping into some early 30s, uh, leading a lot of canoe trips and guiding. And it started with fresh water in the Great Lakes and rivers and you know it's great being here in the NFP because Paddle to the Sea was a formative film for me as a, oh, yeah. as a young kid for sure. Do you remember the first time you saw the ocean? 
I do, and it was um, my grandparents spending time with them. They would spend a lot of time in certain seasons on the ocean, and that was a connection for me. Fresh water, being in the water, and being in canoes, it was it was a place where I felt most at home. It was where the world made sense to me, and I knew that as a really young kid. So I didn't know where that would take me, uh, but when I finally saw the ocean for the first time, it was just that connection of being part of or feeling connected to something bigger. That's really interesting. Sergio, uh, do you remember the first time you came into contact with the ocean? Is that, was that a key moment? I do not remember at all. Yeah, my, my parents must have taken me when I was a baby. Uh, I don't know how old. I think I remember telling me you would set me on the sand when I barely knew how to walk. And I felt the sand was scratchy or something, so I wouldn't like it that much. And to this day, the sand's not my favorite. I love the water, though. Uh, and yeah, and really it was something that my family would go vacations, weekends, um, having grown up in Costa Rica. Uh, yeah, there we have we have the Pacific Ocean on one side and the uh, Caribbean on the other. Uh, and we would go both ways. And so do, I, do you I have a, a really preference, Sergio? I, I'm going to make you decide. Uh, feelings associated to it. But I did grow up in the city, in the capital, in San Jose. Uh, so it was, the ocean was like freedom to me. But uh, I had all these positive ideas. So when I uh, eventually started biology in university, it was natural that marine biology just pulled me directly towards it. So it was something that I felt uh, so, so, so much love for. Yeah. So. And I, I, I think uh, I, they turned my mic off, so I'll ask the question again. So do you have a preference? Which side, uh, which side you like to go on now? Uh, of, the, of the Costa Rican oceans? Yeah. Oh, that's a really tough choice. <laughs> so. Uh, I would say I would say probably the Pacific because the weather's nicer, mo more uh, a bigger percentage of the time. The Caribbean gets very rainy, and now it has the best weather when the weather's nice. It's the best weather and the best conditions, but it's only a few a few moments throughout the year. It's not as consistent as the Pacific. Yeah, I, I would agree with you there. <laughs> so, so Sergio, before we move to round two, we want to show the people here show you in action. Uh, so, you know, you remember our, the trip we took together? Oh, I can never forget. <laughs> what was your favorite memory from that expedition? Oh, that's a really difficult... I, I would say probably seeing uh, hammerhead sharks, the first time scalp hammerheads. That was... But then also going to the submarine was unbelievable. To this day, I still cannot believe it. Um, and just, just in general, being able to go to Cocos Island, because for us Costa Ricans, it is like a myth. Like we, we hear about it since we're young and, and it's, uh, you, you, even as a biologist, you, you still think like, will I ever be able to go? And thanks to Ocean School, I got to go pretty early on in my career. And I would say it's even what made me 100% sure that I was going to be a marine biologist. After that, I was, I was sold in marine biology. Um, no more insects. I was into insects before that, and I was like, no, I'm sorry, entomology. <laughs> I'm, doing, I'm doing marine biology now. <laughs> insects to hammerhead sharks. That's quite a jump there. So let's take a look here at, uh, at uh, Sergio in action uh, off the coast of Cocos Island. We're in the eastern tropic of Pacific, 200 kilometers from Cocos Island where we're heading. It's a vast place. For 24 hours, we've seen nothing but ocean all around. The Pacific is so vast, it holds about half of all the ocean water in the world. What strikes me is, that's the land and that's yes. the ocean. Yeah. So that also blows my mind how you can grab Costa Rica like this and just lay it like almost one and a half times. <laughs> oh, that's true. And it's a distance to, to Coco is almost one and a half times. That's Costa Rica, right. Yeah. The Pacific is so large that you could fit actually all the continents into it and then there would still be room for a Canada or two. It's a very big place. The majority of the Pacific is what's called the open ocean. Open ocean is that portion of the ocean that lies beyond the continental shelf. The continental shelf is actually part of the Earth's crust that makes up landmass. But it's the underwater portion around the land. Coastal waters above the shelf are relatively shallow, but once you hit the open ocean, it gets deep, super deep. We've left the continental yeah, shelf, yeah, which is still, exciting. And you can see the, the drop off is pretty steep, right? Here right. it's still 100 meters, and here it's 500, and then 3,000. And it's so easy to see with the map how quickly it changed. Y esto es más que todo por la zona de subducción, que son dos placas tectónicas que chocan. 
y entonces hacen que una pase por debajo de la otra y el, un pedacito de la otra la empuje hacia abajo entonces tenemos aquí un de repente se hace muy profundo el mar So what I think about 3,000 meters, what does that mean? That's six times the CN Tower, which is the largest building in Canada. Wow, and that's which, quite a lot. was the largest it's building in the world. And incredible. You stack it over six times. That's, that's quite a bit. <laughs> it's deep. That's it's almost too deep. big to imagine. The distance from land, the extreme depths and the host of other unique features are what make the open ocean very different from the coastal waters we're familiar with. Out here, migration is a common survival strategy among many species. Migration is not an easy thing to define. From the perspective that we're looking at, it's a long distance movement that has a certain amount of predictability about it. Whales, turtles, sharks, they're just some of the species in the ocean that take part in long migrations. So why do some marine animals migrate? Adults move to spawning grounds and then they spawn and then the juveniles move off to nursery grounds where they grow and they reach a certain size and they move to the adult grounds. And so you have migration between these three areas. As you grow in the marine environment, your needs are going to be different, especially in terms of food. Our mission is to track the movements of these animals so we can better safeguard their migratory pathways. The more we know about where they go, when and why, the better we can be at helping ensure the journey is safe for years to come. Alright, now let's get into the heart of the subject, ocean literacy, and this, I'm going to start with you, like, this is not a term that a lot of people are familiar with, right? So what does, ocean, at the coalition, what does ocean literacy mean to you? Like, how do you deal with that? Yeah, we saw in the opening clip there, the widely accepted definition and used is the extent to which we understand our impact on the ocean and the ocean's impact on us. And, and that's true. It's, it's, a, it's a good working definition. But we tend to use a, a rela relationship with the ocean. Uh, and I think because there's so many ways people connect with the ocean, and in Canada in particular, you know, we are as big, you know, geographically and culturally diverse. I mean, our country is enormous and there's such diversity on so many levels and scales. And so we all have different relationships and connections and understandings and, and knowledge systems in relation to the ocean. So I think for us, it's, it's, it's starting there. Um, but I also think too, like the term, as you noted, it, it's a, it's a clunky term, like literacy itself is a, is a, problematic term in many ways because it's a deficit model right it implies that there's some body of experts who know more than another group and they have to transfer that knowledge to or down and that's a that's a problematic model and it's have you found something better not well, yet well the one thing i've come to learn when we've been doing the national study and the national strategy which really guides the work that we do is in many ways ocean literacy is a modern term for not indigenous people to catch up to what indigenous people have long known and that is that reciprocal relationship with the ocean. That's very true, that's very true. Sergio, how does ocean literacy sort of play a role in the work, you're, in the work that you're doing? Like, do, how do you see your role as a young scientist in, in that relationship? Well, so um, I am now going in the path of, of shark biology and sharks are one of the groups of animals that are like most harshly exploited and has, have been for the past uh, few decades, right? So the populations for uh, most of the species has, have gone down a lot. Um, and the other third of the species, we know not enough about to know whether they're going down or not. And only a few are actually doing well. And this is mostly because of human activity, mainly fishing and extraction, um, which can have very negative impacts on them. But on the other hand, it's something that gives livelihoods to so many people in the world and who need this as well. So there is no way of doing um, sh uh, shark science that has uh, impacts on the sharks and on the people in a positive way if we don't take into account these two. And there is no way in which we can have people care about the sharks and understand how healthy oceans with healthy sharks will benefit them as well if we don't have ocean literacy. 
So we do have a, a huge um, aspect in our projects, both in the Shark Lab, where I'm at now in, uh, in California, and at the University of Costa Rica with my old lab that I still collaborate with. Um, we have a big uh, aspect of our, of our research is also trying to communicate that research. Um, yeah, and the, the, it's really cool because the origin of those uh, of that learning that I had of the importance of communication to go along with science started with my experience with Ocean School. So it's been a really interesting and cool journey. Anne-Marie, toi, tu, tu as un pied dans la... Anne-Marie, you have one foot in entrepreneurial and one foot in conservation. So to continue on what Sergio was saying, how do you find a balance between the ocean as an, oppor an economical opportunity, but also the ocean as a place that needs to be protected? How do you balance that dilemma? Op economical opportunity is clearly not the first purpose or objective in the sense that the uh, Blue Organization, when I founded it and put it, uh, birthed it into this world to reconnect uh, um, Canadian uh, francophonie, our entire oceanic um, landscape and the St. Lawrence River. Obviously, it comes with a load of challenges when we're talking about entrepreneurship. But I wanted to join a younger public and to inspire them and use uh, communication channels with uh, social networks, for example, and to build a community. That was especially the, the opportunity for me uh, to share my passion on the one hand and to inspire youth to appreciate the St. Lawrence River and to um, retie the links between Quebecers and the St. Lawrence River and to open a conversation in the end to say that together we could help our environment. And I think eight years later is what we are doing now. Said how you finished and how really ocean literacy is kind of a, a term that we've invented for something that the uh, in indigenous communities already knew and, and go to go to Megan I, I kind of have a feeling that ocean literacy for you was something that was just inherent to the way you grew up yeah um, one of the biggest lessons I've learned growing up is that you take only what you need and you don't leave uh, you don't harm any environment that you're a part of so it was just it's just natural and I think like when so much of your life revolves around the ocean it comes naturally also um sorry my cat <laughs> and was it was it really led uh, uh, was it a family thing was it just something that was part of the conversation in everyday life learning about how the, the, the that connection to the ocean oh there he is <laughs> yeah I think we learned uh like through practice so we would spend a lot of time um like going to the cabin for example so each step of the way was a, a lesson to be learned um yeah and is that impacting your work now is is part of sharing that back part of what you what you want to do yeah it's been a bit difficult just growing up in general because I learn more about what's going on with the world and what's going on with the oceans but it also like gives me fuel to share with others especially people who are also interested in like the health of our oceans and ensuring that the um the environment is cared for so yeah but again it's like almost a natural thing to to talk about the ocean in terms of like ocean literacy like you said scott my friend ocean literacy of course is at the heart of ocean school uh, and at the heart of our mission but part of that journey has been i think for me and i think for you understanding that there's multiple ways of knowing uh, how has that I impacted the way you see kind of bringing the ocean to the to, to young people and to the public um well you know in interestingly when we when we started ocean school I, one of the first concepts I learned was inquiry-based learning and, and this idea of critical thinking that education was not about um, facts and, and information per se. It was also about how you use that to, to ask the right questions as much as answer the right questions. I think that, like ocean literacy, is also something that is 
something I've learned is, is part of a kind of natural conversation that happens in indigenous communities because I, I sometimes, we talk about knowledge and I actually think that it's in some ways more appropriate to just talk about learning because knowledge is often being challenged or questioned. And scientists know this too, because as you know, I grew up, my father was, is a scientist and scientists are, you know, we hear about like f fake news and, and, and the, the questioning of science, but scientists are all, always questioning themselves and the information that they get. And, and from what I've gathered, it's a small sample size, but my, my experience with and filming and, and getting to know members of indigenous communities is that that's also a part of that process is constantly learning. Learning is, 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 is really the key as opposed perhaps to knowledge. And, and that makes for great storytelling because you're not, you know, you're creating, you, your storytelling is, is so crude, is so such a foundational part of, of, I think, you know, what Megan's talking about learning, grow, growing up on those journeys to the cabin. It's, it's story, it is a, it is a process of storytelling and through storytelling, we, it's one of the most effective ways of learning. And that is a, you know, what I've, I've learned, if I, if you will, from the, the, the indigenous, um, members of the indigenous communities that I've filmed with, how, how to, how, like, how to kind of use that natural resource in a way to reach, um, the, the, the audience that is Ocean School. So we're going to see kind of an example of that in this, uh, do you want to set up this piece for us? Sure. I mean, we, we, um, we did some filming on central, uh, coast of British Columbia with the Sick Nation, uh, coastal community that very much still depends and, and, on, on the ocean to provide resources uh, for their livelihoods. And um, we really uh, we really wanted to look at different ways of learning, different ways of sharing knowledge, and uh, found that um, this was a place where many scientists from the sort of Western world were collaborating with local members of the, members of the local community to and really enhance their understanding of the environment and the changes that were taking place there. Um, and uh, that, that exchange was, you know, really quite uh, inspiring. And this is a video that, that sort of illustrates how there are different ways of exploring one of these questions and, and, and different ways of, of learning, different ways of knowing, and how those two can, those, those different ways can work together to, in, to enhance our understanding of, of what's happening in our world. Let's have a look. I'm going to go with you guys this time. <laughs> The Windward Isle is a sane fishing boat. They use a smaller boat to take a large net out and circle the school. Then the net is tightened, driving the fish towards the center where they're scooped up in a purse and brought on board. This way, they retrieve big sets of herring. But today is about big data. We're fishing for samples, collecting that data for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. So when you make a set like this, how many fish can you expect to catch? In this area, there's a lot of fish this morning. We could have had a really big set, but we tried to disturb as little as we can while getting a proper sample. 49 number one. The goal is to better understand the population by determining age, sex, and the size of the samples, and to see if the herring are ready to spawn. 73 males. Are all of these spawning right now? Um, soon, I think. We'll have a better idea when the sample's over to see what percent they are. Data of this kind is a newer tool from Western Science to estimate the state of the overall stock. This data is collected from all over the Central Coast region. It's a big net cast wide. But modern methods of modeling have their limitations. Is a big picture actually the complete picture? Does big data tell us what's happening in each and every local area? Is what's happening in Mustang Bay necessarily the same in, say, Spiller Channel? Frank, we have good depth all along here, about 13, 14 feet. Good depth all along here. We're getting spawning herring sample accounts first so they can do some aging work, the age of the herring and the stalks there. 
First Nations have always been saying that each individual spawning area has its own characteristics that differ from other spawning areas. We have been here for thousands of years. We see how things change, or not, with our very own eyes. And our knowledge is built up over time, with each generation adding its observations and experience. Now, our guardian watchmen are working with scientists, adding our perspective by focusing on specific spawning spots. So the work we're doing is providing the scientific language to express those differences in size and age between spawning areas. Once again, we're fishing for herring samples, but this time on a much smaller scale. From the previous two years of sampling, we know that fish in the spiller channel area have the slowest growth rates compared to fish that are more on the outer coast. So that would be consistent with what First Nations have been saying for a long time, that the, each individual spawning area has its own characteristics and therefore needs to be managed individually. Yeah, a little bit of a workout going on. <laughs> All right, I want to look forward a little bit now uh, because, you know, most... Mo a lot of us know that uh, this decade, from 2021 to 2030, is the UN Ocean Decade for Sustainable Development. Uh, we're three years in, and I kind of want to ask, like, when you look forward to the end of the decade, what, what dreams do you have? What do you hope that's going to happen? Uh, what changes would you like to see? Je vais commencer avec toi, Anne-Marie, si tu penses. We'll start with you, Anne-Marie. If you think about Organisation Bleu, how do you see coming years? Do you have hope? Do you have concerns? If you were to be given a magical wand and if you could change something, what would you do? That's a good question. Well, the magical wand would do so many things. Of course, there is hope because on a daily basis in our work, we see people getting engaged. They're passionate and the subject is a topical subject. Of course, we are talking about this more and more. Medias are, are interested in this subject. So if we think about the future in 2030, for example, well, I would wish to say uh, a greater area of the St. Lawrence to be protected, that we reach the sustainable development goal, a notion that is better protected, better framed where biodiversity is better understood and managed. I see hope in very specific cases, such as uh, the Quebec, dans le coin de la Côte Nord, such as the work at the Magpie River in the, the North Shore. Tomorrow, we are working with an organization that is working at uh, the uh, legal aspects. We are giving a uh, judicial persona to national resources. We are working on this file to provide this legal persona to the Saint Lawrence. That's a a big term. We are very hopeful. We are structuring a law to, so that it be recognized as an entity that we must take care of. So this is a very specific case, but there is hope. Again, in all projects that come to light, I'm thinking about the expedition, the three-week expedition last year in the St. Lawrence. We raised many thousands of dollars to carry out this mission. And here, there is a vision from managers and administrators who believe in the importance of better document, monitor, all of that in order to come out with various observations. There are things that are alarming. We were, we considered that there was a lot of plastic pollution, but when politicians, when the media are focusing on these various issues, you know, more and more we have exposure and that gives us hope because there's a lot of interest Of course, this is a double-edged sword, but when the media is there to showcase what we do, it can have an impact, that's for sure. Something that resonates for you in Costa Rica, is it something that's in the public sphere? And I guess the other thing is, when you think 10 years from now, when you think 2030, what, what changes would you like to see? In Costa Rica, we're having a look with uh, uh, 
the things the government does and people in power do about the ocean, what the general population of Costa Rica wants, and what the fish in Costa Rica want, right? So, I mean, I guess the, the best example, the closest example to me would be the, the shark fishing uh, situation, the shark finning situation. Um, there's been a lot of progress. Uh, shark finning used to be legal in Costa Rica, and the finning itself would be super intense, and the sharks would get their fins cut off, the rest of the shark would be thrown away, uh, and so the mortality was really, really high. Now, uh, things have changed. It's still somewhat high, uh, but the sharks are brought in whole, so there's less sharks that you can bring in a boat. That helps the population a little bit. Um, we do see, however, that even though we are now part of CITES, uh, right, the international conventions that regulate whether we can ship or not shark fins and shark parts, uh, particularly the more, more vulnerable species to other countries, um, they regulate that we should not, because we cannot export those species. They're still sometimes done under the table. And then we have lots of parties that are trying to remove that and go back to how things were before and have everyone fishing sharks and finning sharks um, however they want. Similarly with the bottom troll fishery, um, only a small group of fishermen that are related to the bottom troll fishery benefit from it, while the rest of artisanal fisheries uh, throughout the, the Pacific of the country are greatly harmed by it because it's a very intensive uh, method that captures a lot of bycatch and hurts a lot of different species that are not the target species. Um, and that one was made illegal a few years back, but now the new government is trying to make it legal again, despite scientific uh, results and communities from other places and other saying how damaging it was and how much recovery there's been since it's been removed. So there's big conflicts of interest with all of this. What I would hope is that we can find a way to go forward without having to go a couple steps back every few years um, and hopefully um, yeah, come to the consensus that these things are very short-lived and this kind of, of, of fishing is very short-lived and will only help some people for a small period of time, uh, but will not be good for the country uh, in, the, in the long term, right? So I would hope by the end of the decade, this is a little clearer um, and that the government somehow represents a little more of the, uh, of the people that do care about the ocean in Costa Rica or, or care about it in that way and understand that. Uh, but it's going to have to be a process that uh, takes into account those communities as well, because clearly it's not working to just tell them, no, you cannot fish there, right? So I think it's going to be something that's going to happen with small projects and small communities and work from small little hops and change rather than a top-down thing that has not been working so far. Uh, and it's going to take researchers like you make, making this argument for sure. Thanks. <laughs> Megan. I hope to be here. <laughs> Megan, when you put your researcher hat on, because you wear many hats, but you have a researcher hat, what are the questions you're hoping to answer in your research in the next, it, it, but for the next few years? Well, I've been fortunate to take part in, in research, both on, the, both on the Coast Guard, but also on the on longliners. And one of the things that I think about the most is how a lot of organizations tend to want to include Indigenous voices rather than letting Indigenous people lead or like take initiative. So that's what I hope to see change. Like I would like to, not just myself, but for Indigenous people to be invited to to lead something rather than provide like provide knowledge or whatnot. Because if if keep, things keep going the way they are, and we're just personally, I'm just tired sometimes of saying the same things over and over. Like I don't want to just share my knowledge i want to be able to implement something with what i know and to be part of something like instead of just um being there to share my perspectives you know and are you seeing some examples of that starting to happen or or we need to push harder we need to push harder <laughs> okay that's we need good. to we need to pat ourselves on the back when we do something good but we can't stop there we have to keep going well, that's a good challenge for sure. Scott, a, a decade of ocean science, like when you look at the next 10 years, are there stories out there that are just like, you're just itching to tell? Uh, like as a storyteller, is there, is there something out there that we just haven't managed to tell that you're dying to tell? Uh, a few, maybe a few. 
<laughs> I said earlier to someone, I can't remember who it was, I said, they said, I, when I talk to people about what I, th what I do, people who know me from my freelance life, they say, you're still working on Ocean School? I said, like, yeah, well, the ocean's kind of big. <laughs> <laughs> See, there's a lot going on there. Um, you know, I, I, it's a tricky question, Jacques. I, I think that for me, um, I don't know that I have a specific answer to like what what the story is because there's so many that we're that we're exploring. I mean, I think I think the way Ocean School is sort of um, positioned to really reflect on the relationship between we as people and the ocean, and I think one of my aspirations, if you will, is to is to and and my Ocean School colleagues will kind of roll their eyes because I say this all the time is to really connect with that kid in Saskatchewan who lives in the prairies. Because um, I think I'll borrow a phrase from one of our collaborators in, in our, our BC project, um, John Reynolds, who's a researcher there, who said, everything we do ends up in the ocean. Everything. And, and another, uh, Max LeBron, who's, an, who's a, also a, a ocean plastics researcher, says, you know, the ocean is downhill from everything. So, so, you know, how do we connect stories that aren't necessarily traditionally ocean stories? So we've done these amazing stories with Sergio going out and, and tagging sharks. But what about the story that happens in the middle of the country where, you know, many people live? How does that, what's the, what's the connection? What about the stories that connect those people with the ocean? Because we're all impacted by it. That's kind of... A place I'd like to to spend some more time and energy. Yeah, makes sense. There's Canada's Ocean Decade champion. You you know, do, do you get like a, a, a sash or anything that comes with that? <laughs> oh, how do you see the opportunities that this decade offers? Do you like? Do you think Canada's playing its role? Should we be doing more? Where, where, where do you think we sit in all that? Yeah, big big question. I I think Canada is doing doing a lot. I mean, the the decades an incredible opportunity, and really, it, it's that's what it is. Like, it doesn't come with money. It doesn't come. It's it's an opportunity for collaboration. It's a framework for action, and it's a chance for us to kind of mobilize and work together. And there's seven objectives to the decade, and most of them are very science based. You know, a clean ocean, a resilient ocean, a productive ocean, and that enables the scientific community globally to self-organize around those. But it also has 10 challenges, and challenge 10 is the overarching foundational challenge of the decade, and that's to transform humanity's relationship with the ocean. And I think for me, is the one thing I don't want to happen is we get to 2030, and that just remains a aspirational ambition. Like, I think we need to actually map out measurements that will enable us to see throughout these coming years if we're moving the needle or not. You know, what type of work, what type of outreach, what type of storytelling, what type of science and what type of actioning of science and what type of, you know, Indigenous-led research, you know, is really moving the needle and changing not just understanding but really changing behaviour because we don't have any more time for just better understanding. Like, we've really got to get to behaviour change. And so we need to be able to show by 2030 that we've done that. So that's one. Yeah, Can go. I oh, just yeah, you got, two, got, yeah, two yeah, go, 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 go. Yeah, I mean, that by 2030, I want to make sure Canada's hit that target of protecting 30% of the marine waters by 2030 and, in fact, exceeding that. And then I think the third thing I'd love to see is that, and, I mean, these two, Sergio and Meg, and right here are just absolute examples. Um, so one thing is we older people just need to get out of the way because there's... There's the answer right there. I like there. when you looked at me there well, when I did, you said I that. did give a little bit of a look, <laughs> but I'm close behind. <laughs> but I think also just what, how we do research. It's slowly changing, but it's changing because of the young generation. And that's to not think of like outreach and that sharing of knowledge at the end of a project where it's like, okay, we've done all this, here's our findings. Oh, we've got a little bit of extra money. Let's do a little outreach. You know, that'd be nice to have, whereas it's actually part of the co-design. So you bring educators and storytellers. And of course, I mean, right at the very start is, I mean, not just indigenous knowledge keepers at the start, but they're actually defining the projects and then in come the artists and everyone to really help tell the story from the start to finish of what the research is, why it's being done, why it's relevant, how it's transforming communities, how it's led to behavior change. And I think if we can do that, we will have achieved some good stuff. That's a tall order, but we're going to do our best for sure. Now, before we start our fourth and final round, I, we want to share one more video. 
Uh, one that tries to sort of set the stakes and lay out some of the challenges facing the ocean. It's a piece that uh, we're, we're happy that has traveled uh, uh, a little bit around the world thanks to Ocean, ocean School's founding partner, the Ocean Frontier Institute. It was at the heart of the Canadian Pavilion at COP27 and at COP15. And it features the writing of uh, British author Helen Scales and the voice of Sarika Kulis Suzuki. Uh, we're, we're big fans of it. Uh, and it's called Love Leather to the Ocean. The ocean breathes in and out, like the rhythm of the tides, connecting everything from the outer skies to the deepest seas. And at its heart is carbon. Carbon, the building block of life. It fuels nature's solar-powered machinery. From the redwoods to the savanna, to the eelgrass meadows and kelp forests in the sea. And phytoplankton that together, in such abundance, often paint the ocean green. The captured carbon then passes on through all living things, through krill and fish, birds and whales, butterflies and flowers, and you. Most living things hold on to carbon only briefly. Every time we exhale, we let carbon go. When life ends, carbon floats up into the sky or settles down buried in the soil. But in the ocean, things are different. It inhales more than it exhales and sends carbon into the abyss for hundreds and thousands of years. It is the ocean, more than anything else on Earth, that holds the balance. But we humans are releasing ever more carbon, extracting, drilling, and burning ancient carbon stores. And the carbon gathering around the planet has taken on a new identity. No longer just building and powering life, but now disrupting and threatening it too. As we reach for more, taking without thought, discarding without care, the ocean struggles to maintain the balance, to absorb all that carbon. How much is too much? How far is too far? The ocean breathes like the rhythm of the tides, connecting everything. All life depends on this. All life depends on the ocean. So one last round uh, about curiosity and inspiration and wisdom. That's kind of work. We got wise people here. We want it. We want wisdom. The bar. That's the bar. Wisdom is where we're sort of, you know. And I, I think I'll start with Megan. Megan, how if if we're looking to inspire people to have a stronger, deeper connection to the ocean? What would you say to them? What would you say to people to to get them to understand the importance of of being connected to nature and to and to the ocean? 
I would try to make it personal because I feel if people um, feel that they have a personal connection to something, they're more inclined to care about it or to put effort into it. And a big part of that is storytelling. So the only things I could say to somebody is like things that I know or things that I have experienced. So I would share like um, stories about my time home on the coast and how it sustained like Inuit, but also so many other indigenous peoples around the world. And that if somebody wants to like do something, but don't know what to do, or if they feel they have to give somehow that they could work on, like not just like ocean literacy, but also finding ways to implement, um, implement a better environmental practices within their lives, but also within like wherever they work. And I would also call on governments and organizations too, because if we want to talk about changing our practices, obviously it's important for us to find ways to reduce plastic waste, for example, but we also need governments and other organizations or uh, corporations to do their part as well, because a lot of the responsibility falls on us as individuals and that's okay to an extent, but they have a role to play also. There's some leadership for sure that needs to be to be uh, shown there. I think we need people making that argument, people like you. Scott, you've chased stories, ocean stories. Much. What's the what wisdom or insight do you have to share about about uh, the role the ocean plays in people's lives, or or how they might feel more connected to it? Um. Yeah. It, it's. I mean. The, the education uh, like that we're trying to promote that, like I mentioned, the kid in Saskatchewan, like that, that the connection is, I think, crucial. Uh, um, understanding, though, yeah, we need, to, we need behavioral changes, um, which, which I think, you know, in some ways begins with understanding and then, but then we, we're, we're out of time. We need to, we need to quickly move to behavior. Uh, our calls to action, like we, we talk about an ocean school, we, with everything we do, we try and have a call to action. And that's really challenging. Uh, I think right, right now, um, I have two children who are in teenage, my 14 year old, and a 12 year old. And there are, you know, I think what will become known as the COVID generation. And, um, I, I was really interested to hear your Emery talk about hope. And I think this is a real key thing for us is to, is to, um, kids, the kids are, are, are scared about, I think, I think we're scared about the future of the earth and we need to know that there's, there is the possibility of change. And that's really tough for the COVID generation because they lost so many opportunities, things that they worked hard for. We all did, but like, this is a, you know, a, a generation of kids who, you know, the high school uh, uh, graduation or prom or whatever, their hockey tournament or just things that are so central to their lives and they didn't have any control. Like, so, so to, to tell right now, I think, I think what is important is that we understand the stakes, like you just saw in that, in that film, which still makes me tear up every time I see it, but also, Where's the hope? And, and, and really uh, demonstrating um, and inspiring, uh, you know, using insp uh, inspirational messages of hope that we, so that, so that uh, their next generation of, of change makers have the, have the confidence that what they do will make a difference. And Marie, toi, uh, a bijou de sagesse que tu aurais t as envie de partager? And uh, do you have a wise message to share with us and how people can experience a better connection to the ocean. I'd like to uh, pursue on what Scott was saying. It's true that we often feel um, destructive in the societal world uh, surrounding us, but also in the way that we live our lives. Uh, hope resides in light. And to turn towards the light and focusing towards that helps to pull ourselves out of a an anxious state and obviously the generation is very affected by uh, concerns of the future several people don't want any children others believe they won't even have the right to live their entire lives because there's some sort of an end and a doom on the way but when we 
focus on a positive aspects and hope that it needs to be amplified. And that's where there are lots of solutions in my perspective. And then, of course, there is a lot of hope in a movement when we're taking action, when we're moving forward. And that's when we can start projecting ourselves into the future. The future is not all gray, nor is it incredibly hot. There is a future where we can transform our destiny and learn. For me, it's to look forward and looking at the light and to say there is hope and to say, yes, we work with politicians, we work with businesses, we work with the community. And it's not just the environment, it's the larger societal movements as well at the title of humanity where we might be observing ourselves intrinsically and the paradigm needs to change. And I feel it is changing. We have more exposure, we're talking about it much more, and everyone seems to want to move forward, and that's where I am hopeful. Great, thank you. The time you spent in and on the ocean, I'm wondering what, what, what has the ocean taught you that you'd like to teach to other people? Well, I guess um, going going along with the, the main lesson from Ocean School, um, which I did start learning as I started working with Ocean School and eventually started going to marine biology, I see, and as Carl was saying, right, that connection of everything we do on land going back to the ocean, I think I started learning that until I started dealing with the ocean in a way that was more, I guess, more professional and more serious than just it being my my place to go for leisure and for rest and for and for freedom and peace. Um, and yeah, and the 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 problems with it just seem so much more serious and um, interconnected and so much related to so many other things than they did before I became a marine biologist and started delving into marine biology. And oh, being someone that comes from a country that's so geogra or well, a town, right? Uh, San Jose in the middle of Costa Rica, but two hours away from the Pacific, four hours away from the Caribbean. We're still so disconnected in the city and in those um, land areas of Costa Rica. We're so disconnected from the ocean that, for example, um, most people don't know that most of the fish that's sold in Costa Rica it comes or historically has come from sharks and no one was ever told there it's just sold as fish and people just buy this fish because we don't even have a culture where we question what we're eating from the ocean right um so that that was that was a realization that was both shocking um uh, and worrying uh because it's a big job to do but it's also uh exciting because it shows uh how if we do get these people interested in the ocean, and they are, because people who know little of the ocean start talking to me when they find out I work with all these things, and they're usually very excited about it. So I think it's just a matter of putting in a little effort from various different angles, from education, uh, from just talking to people, from media, uh, from, from yeah, public education even, right? Um, and that can help change people's perspective of this. And I think those changes are gonna be very meaningful. Uh, but it's going to be a lot of work getting there, I guess. <laughs> Tiz, I'm going to close with you, and I'm going to bring you back to 2017 and the exceptional journey that you took with C3 going around this huge country. And I'm thinking that there might have been some wisdom that would have come from that trip. Thanks, Jacques. Yeah, Jacques's referring to the Canada C3 expedition. That was a five-month journey across the entire coastline of Canada. We left Toronto, I think it was June 1st, and finished in Victoria at the end of October and it yeah it was I mean what a privileged opportunity and you know what I learned there I mean there's so many things and I Megan it's so great to see you and I'm thinking about all the Inuit communities like 50 percent of Canada's coastlines in the Arctic right and so few Canadians know that um, and by the time we left Newfoundland all the way around until we came down pretty close to Vancouver we were exclusively in Indigenous territories Coastal First Nation in Inuit. And again, like it's a narrative that Canadians don't know. Like you're talking about the inland Canadians and the 30 million who live nowhere near the coast. Like that is not a national narrative yeah. and it's essential and it needs to be. 
And thank goodness for the those communities along the way. That's been thousands of years of stewardship because I can't imagine where we'd be, you know, without that that leadership and vision. But I think for me, what like two things that struck out um, or stuck out the most was, um, you know, as essential as science is, as, as humans, we don't we don't act on what we know. We act on what we feel. We act on this. And it's, so Megan was right, it has to be personal. Like if learning or just experience, it's not personal, culturally relevant, locally or locally relevant, you know, culturally appropriate, it doesn't stick. Like it, it has to be tangible. And, and absolutely it has to be hopeful, like more now than ever. Like there, and I think as diverse as Canada is and our diversity is our strength, like we are more similar than we are different. And I think leaning into that and so it's really stories not just that are personal and hopeful but it's stories that are about connection and stories you know that are about collaboration and partnership because we are only going to get to where we need to get to if we do it together that's very very true we're at the thank yous I, i'm going to thank these people but before i thank both these people i just want to say we've been downstairs in the public uh the nfb public place uh space uh since monday and we've done all sorts of really uh, amazing things, mostly because Ocean School has an unbelievable team that worked really hard to do that. So those Ocean School people in the room, could you stand up for a minute and could we give them a round of applause? <laughs> they might not, not, not that many of them are here because they're, down, they're downstairs, but uh, we have a very, very collaborative and, uh, and dynamic team and we couldn't do any of this stuff w without them. I want to thank Scott for sharing with us today, and Anne Marie and Sergio. It's so good to see you, and Megan and your cat. Both of you, I thank you. <laughs> thank you for joining us, and this. Thank you very much for being with us today. I hope everybody uh, leaves here a little more inspired. Uh, I certainly am, and ready to rock and roll. Let's go. <laughs> now, a few little things. We've got like we've got like four minutes. If there are questions, anybody has a question? We got four minutes. Anybody? Or are you shy? Okay, you're shy. It's been the term we. Uh, hello. <laughs> I missed you. One more time for the people on well, Facebook. Well, first, thank you very much for, for this panel. The whole evening was, uh, was fantastic so far. And I heard that it's not over yet, so no, thank no. you. Uh, a quick question. I work in technology, I work with startups, and I love what I do. But I have this question around, do you believe that technology can actually help save the, save the ocean? Or is it really just an action that civil society and politicians and electorates has to do? I can jump. Go. <laughs> Je réponds en français ou en anglais? Well, come to oh, come to you. I'll answer French or in English or as you want in Spanish as well. I'm jumping in because I'm an interpreter on top of being a biologist. I wear many hats as well. Currently, I'm part of an incubator with Sue Montreal, not to do a pitch for them, but we are welcomed with open arms in the creative uh, sector with uh, AV technologies and since I'm, be, I'm part of the entrepreneurship environment, I, I work with uh, other innovation and technological sector actors. There's a lot of potential there. On the one hand, for a project that we've been developing for many years on environmental monitoring, amongst others on the St. Lawrence, but this could be scaled up uh, to cover the entire planet, the use of AI, artificial intelligence, even though it can be scary when it's properly structured, it can really be positive to protect the environment. The sea is so big that we won't have the choice to turn to technologies to monitor this environment through satellite monitoring, to truly monitor the, this water, to better monitor protected areas. That's one thing, and as well, AV technologies that can truly be helpful to connect the public through the metaverse, for example, or by uh, bringing people in the environment uh, in a fashion to have them go through an experience that would be almost uh, real. We're talking about feelings and emotions. It is through that that it will be done, I believe. And there are many opportunities to seize here. 
Thank you for the question. La soirée pas finie. The night is not over. With us, we, we have a concert by Qualité Motel. Il y a un concert de Qualité Motel. There's a concert by Qualité Hotel in the old port. And since we are the ocean school, we have a school bus waiting for us. If you feel like going down to the old port, there is a school bus at the corner of Mayer and de Blairie waiting for you. Hop in, I'll be going. And if then you feel like coming back downtown, uh, through a partnership with the Quartier des Spectacles, the Wilder building right next to this one uh, will be uh, lighted with images from the Ocean School. We just can't wait. I saw pictures of the tests and I was excited. You know, to see this for real today will be quite something. It will be fun. Thank you so much for coming. What we've uh, done tonight will be available on our Facebook and uh, page on YouTube. If you have friends, colleagues who you feel would be interested, well, share this with them. Share the link, share the info, and thank you so much for being here. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much, have a good one.